Okay. Um, all right. We are very, very fortunate tonight to be joined by a very special someone. Uh, her name is Megan Nico. And Megan is a science illustrator whose work has been used by Cornell Lab of Ornithology, oh my gosh, uh, by Elkhorn Slough, um, by Pinnacles National Park, and a handful of other entities. Uh, so we are in for a treat of treats. And her work is also sold in the nature store at Henry Cal Redwood State Park. Uh, and for those of you who have gone in and seen some of her artwork, it's really inspiring. And if you're anything like me, it really sparks a sense of, of stewardship for the natural history in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And so uh, let's, let's give Megan a, a warm welcome uh, and our, our utmost attention. Megan. Thank you. And uh, thanks, Dylan. And thank you, everybody, for having me. I'm just going to um, share my screen so that um, I can, yeah, just jump right into my presentation to give me just a moment here. Okay. So I think you should be able to see my screen. And um, I'm going to put it in presenter mode. So um, thanks again for having me. I, I really appreciate it. I'm really excited to, um, to be here and to share with you a little bit about my work. Um, and we'll talk about this piece, um, which I, I think you're probably all familiar with all of these creatures. Um, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so <laughs> this is a picture of me in, I don't know, sometime in the early 80s, probably. Um, I grew up in the Bay Area um, and my parents grew up there as well. And so I, um, I really saw the transition from the Valley of Heart's Delight, right? The agricultural community um, that it was and as it transitioned into Silicon Valley. And part of that transition um, is tied to this picture in that, that pheasant that is in this photograph. Um, is a taxidermied uh, pheasant that my dad shot on his way to work. Um, <laughs> he worked in Milpitas at the time. And I think it was just like in the grasslands along the highway somewhere. And, um, you know, my dad was a bird hunter and he carried a shotgun in his truck. And um, yeah, so he came home one day with a pheasant um, that we actually ate also. Um, that was also part of my, my growing up. And so, you know, I had this kind of un, kind of interesting um, experience of growing up in this very urban place, but having a lot of connection to to wildlife and to wilderness um, and to kind of wild things, even in this place that was really um, changing away, moving away from that um, had been for a long time, but I think really uh, moved away from it significantly, you know, when I was growing up. Um, but I spent a lot of time like riding bikes and kind of just being out in, in orchards and that kind of thing. And um, that was very much like a part of my kind of inspiration for the, you know, kind of the work I do now. Um, so I talked a little bit, my dad, you know, my dad was a bird hunter. And so um, there were always wild birds in our house, dead wild birds, um, but also his hunting licenses. So you know, because he was hunting duck and um, upland game birds, he had um, fish and game hunting licenses that had artwork, beautiful artwork um, on them. And I think that was like one of my first exposures to that kind of art, to wildlife art. Um, and it was just something that I was really always kind of fascinated by. And that's what I learned to draw from. Like that's, those are the things I drew first, right? I've learned to draw a duck. That was the first thing I learned how to draw. I, at least what I remember learning how to draw. Um, so yeah, so that, you know, that's kind of where I started. Um, and, you know, just a little bit more background, like my family has been in California for se at least seven generations. I represent that seventh generation. Um, my grandpa was a free diver on the central coast primarily. So Point Lobos and, um, all up and down the coast when you could still dive for abalone. Um, and, you know, my mom's family um, lived at Wilder Ranch before the Wilders did. Um, and so I just have a lot of connections to kind of lots of parts of California and, and the kind of wildness 
um, that still exists here. You know, it's pretty amazing to me how much of that is still around. And I think, um, you know, as I've continued to live here, I've, you know, lived here most of my life. I spent a few years out of the state, but primarily I've spent most of it here. And, and I've really developed a connection to kind of our state and national parks. You know, I spend time at Henry Cowell and Mount Diablo and um, Point Reyes and, you know, all kinds of state parks that are just some of my favorites. Um, and then of course, national parks. Um, so I volunteer at Pinnacles National Park now. Um, I'm a wildlife volunteer there. Um, and I get to do all kinds of different species work. I work with um, raptors in the spring and condors in the fall and butterflies in between and um, outside the COVID times um, also with bats, um, which of course is on hold until we know that it's safe for the bats for us to, to handle them. Um, and then I have also done some artisan residence work um, and uh, Dylan mentioned Elkhorn Slough. So I did a artisan residence there maybe two or three years ago now, um, and also up in the Plumas National Forest. And so the artists in residence really helped me kind of think about what stories need to be told, right? Or what stories I want to tell as an artist. Um, and like being in a place like Elkhorn Slough where I'm like totally immersed in this place, I have totally, you know, full access to, um, exploring and learning and connecting with the you know the researchers and and learning about some of the um, the research that's going on there and and all of that really helped me kind of think about like well, what's the picture that I want to paint and how do I use my art skills um, to tell that story um, and I guess I haven't talked about where my art skills came from I talked a little bit about um, learning to draw ducks um, and then you know I was I've been drawing my whole life my there's lots of artists in my family um and um i did i did get a formal art degree as an undergraduate um and then i did the science illustration program at um uc santa cruz in the last year that it was at uc santa cruz so i graduated in 2009 and i um i uh and then I went to Cornell. That was my project at Cornell, um, you know, or my internship. Part of my my um, program was to do an internship. So I was at Cornell for about four months um, illustrating hummingbirds, which was a total dream. Um, Dylan, your your reaction was exactly my reaction. Like, really? They're going to let me come there? Oh, my gosh. Um, and so, yeah, so I've been, you know, doing science illustration um, since then formally and um and the artist in residence thing has really been part of that too right um going to places that um really have an uh connection with both art and science um so uh oh what happened to my advance here mm, there we go um so when I was at Elkhorn Slough, I did not expect that otters would be the thing that I would like focus on because it was like, oh, you know, ever there's so much that we know about otters and the stories are so well documented and I feel like everyone knows like all the things about otters. Um, but I was connected with the researchers there and I got to go out and like help them do surveys and, you know, monitor a, an otter that was like you know kind of trapped on one side of the road and lost landing and i just got i was just you know it's just hard not to be charmed by a species like that um and so and then i was really thinking about well what you know what's the story with otters and i found this quote from lillian carswell um some of you might be familiar with her work with fish and wildlife service she's based in santa cruz and she does a lot of work with southern sea otter recovery and she has this beautiful piece of writing which you know is like for fish and wildlife um but it's there's it's just really inspiring and one of the things she talks about is this recovery right we think about when we care about you know it's really easy to care about otters right they're cute and they're interesting and they're mammals and they're you know they have all these unique characteristics and they're local to us and so we get to get kind of excited about about them, but I think it's really easy for folks to forget that when we are talking about recovery for species, we really have to think about how they fit into ecosystems and that we have to also take care of the places that they live because it's not enough just to make sure that there's enough individuals, right? They also have to have a healthy place to live and, and thrive where they are. So um, 
so I really started thinking about how do I tell that story and how do I um, help people kind of see that, right? And so this is kind of one of the first pieces I did in this series. I had been kind of playing with this idea of these kind of ecosystem or food web relationships and, and putting them into these kind of symmetrical um, circular uh, illustrations, but this was the first one that it, I think it kind of, it kind of clicked for me. Um, and Lillian's kind of words helped me really think about that and, and kind of start to think about what else I might want to include in that picture. So, um, so how does this work? <laughs> this is a pile of books that Liz currently on my desk. Um, and I always start with research, right? Like whether it's talking with folks who are doing the work, whether I'm reading, um, sometimes it's because I'm at a place, right? So artists in residency is a great experience. It's a really awesome time to really be inspired by a place. Like I said, I did not expect that Elkhorn would inspire me to work on otter things, but <laughs> you know, I just never know. Um, and so I really spent a lot of time kind of doing a deep dive into the science, right? I'm like learning about the relationships. I'm trying to figure out like, well, how do I decide what species to include and what are, you know, what other things might be critical to the story? And, you know, I'm just, I just do a ton of research. And I think when I've calculated my time um, for each piece, like my research takes at least half of the total time. Um, and that's just, you know, deep, deep dives um, so that I make sure I really understand it. Um, and, you know, because if I don't and I, um, I get it wrong. <laughs> I mean, first of all, it's, it's like painful to me, um, but also I know someone will let me know. And that's like, you know, so, um, so I try to get it right as much as I can. And knowing that the science also continues to change. So I have to kind of be ready for that as well. Um, and then once I start to, you know, once I've kind of narrowed it down, then I start to do a lot of sketching. And so this picture kind of shows you like my sketchbook. I use like a a protractor and a compass on a piece of paper with a pencil um, to kind of lay out, you know, I, I draw these circles and I you know, kind of like figure out, okay, well, where's each element gonna go? And I start to kind of put the elements together and, and it, you know, it's a process. It, it continues to evolve even though I think I know, you know, I've, I've done a bunch of drawings and I think like, oh yeah, it's gonna look like this. And then as I start drawing it, you know, it always changes. So I'm kind of constantly fussing with it, and, you know, changing, moving things around and that kind of thing. Um, so that's my kind of sketching and, and layout process. And this also takes me a long time because I'm really, I'm always kind of trying to balance things. Um, and then, so I do all my preliminary drawings on tracing paper that allows me to kind of move things around and, and you know, turn them and, and all that kind of stuff. And then I start to put, transfer them onto watercolor paper. So these, each of these individual pieces is on a, an individual piece of um, tracing paper. I transfer them onto watercolor paper and then I really refine the drawings and, you know, make sure I'm correcting things and make sure like, is the, you know, how many of the tail feathers can you see or, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, what are the stems like, you know, on this jewel flower or spine flower? Um, you know, all those kinds of things. I'm, I'm still kind of adjusting. Um, and sometimes I get to this point, I've transferred the drawing and I realize there's a big hole. <laughs> so I need to add something. Um, and I'll talk about that in a piece um, I show you later. But yeah, I just, you know, still refining, still refining. Once I get everything transferred, then I ink it. Um, and so I use a brush and India ink, um, and I brush in every element of the illustration. Um, and so sometimes people ask me like, oh, these are so symmetrical, like you must do it, you know, with a computer or whatever. And I'm like, nope, <laughs> I do it all by hand. They're all different. And so I actually draw each of these things. Sometimes, you know, like in this one, um, I draw four dippers and four salamanders and four um of the eyed sphinx moth and four of these like little branches of willows so um yeah i draw i draw them all again and again 
Um, and then I take it to a photographer because I like to have the ink drawing captured for like other uses. So um, I, you know, have these drawings screen printed on tote bags and tea towels and, and all kinds of stuff. And Elkhorn Slough used one of these for um, a volunteer shirt, uh, like a t-shirt for like a volunteer appreciation gift. Um, and so having the line drawings is really helpful because once the color is in there, it's it's really hard to separate all of that out. So I have it photographed at this stage. Um, and then uh, and then it's time to add watercolor. And sometimes, like in the example of the Ohlone tiger beetle, which is such an iconic species and such an unusual color, I do some test strips because I'm like, well, how do I get this color? Like, I don't even know what this color is, you know, and it's certainly not coming out of my tube of paint. So I've got to figure it out and, and like, oh, there's all this red in this creature or there's, is it red or is it pink or is it orange or what is it? So um, yeah, so I do a little bit of, sometimes I do a little bit of watercolor, um, you know, kind of sketching and, and trying to figure out the color matching. Um, and then I put in all the watercolor. And this is what they look like when they're finished. Um, and so this piece was uh, inspired by Elkhorn Slough, right? Um, I was there, I think I was trying to remember, I think I was in the fall. And so um, the pickleweed wasn't super red. I think it must've been early fall. Um, and the, you know, there weren't tons of birds there, but there were definitely some like the willets just kind of, you know, they hang around and they don't, you know, they don't um, take off for the, for the winter. And so, um, but they're there in their kind of winter plumage, which is a little bit duller than their, their breeding plumage. And so it's just neat to see them. And there's just all these kind of cool creatures that hang out in these salt marshes. And, and so learning about all these um, different, you know, uh, the different organisms that rely on salt marshes and that's just so diverse. And I think, you know, just not, um, well, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> I certainly didn't appreciate how complex um, salt marsh ecosystems were um, until I spent some time at Elkhorn Slough and, and you know, and just like, yeah, as a, like a hatchery for fish and, and all kinds of stuff. Um, this piece is about um, California condors, so close to my heart. I, um, you know, I think I'll never forget the first time I saw condors flying in Big Sur. I just, I just can't imagine that will be something I ever forget. Um, and I, you know, because I work with them at, at Pinnacles, um, I sometimes get to be, you know, I just have an insight into them that I, that I really um, treasure. And so, um, you know, as we've learned about their recovery and what, you know, what they, what they do out there in the world, you know, I think it was off everyone's radar that they would eat sea mammals, right? Um, and, you know, of course, there's all kinds of complications with that, with DDT still being in the marine environment and all of that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, they certainly eat sea mammals um, on the Big Sur coast. And um, I think we hope as they move north um, up on the northern coast as well. Um, deer, of course, represent the, you know, um, terrestrial mammals that they eat. Um, they don't eat a lot of deer. They actually eat more cows and pigs, but I just could not bring myself to include a non, <laughs> you know, domesticated species um, when talking about wild animals. But it is true that they they do rely a lot on things like wild pigs um, and, and cattle and that kind of thing um, who, that have died, you know, for various reasons, um, at least especially here on the Central Coast. Um, and then the the salmon was really a nod to uh, you know when I did this piece in 2018 I think I knew that there were conversations with Fish and Wildlife about um, introducing condors up at Redwood, um, and now that's you know official and and is happening and so that was kind of my nod to like yeah condors we're we're gonna get to see them up in a place that they haven't been and and I don't know how long. Um, and, you know, but the historical record shows that they would have been, you know, relying on salmon runs during the spawning season. So um, I'm really excited about that. So this is kind of a really fun way for me to think about um, what it's, what it means for, you know, a, a recovery of a species that doesn't have a, isn't tied to a specific habitat. Um, 
So now I want to kind of focus on the, the things that are probably most familiar to you all um, at Henry Cowell and in the Redwoods. Um, so this is a series that I started doing research for um, probably in the fall of 2019. And I was pretty ready to go in terms of like, I kind of knew all, you know, what habitats I want to focus on. I knew I wanted to do a series about Santa Cruz mountains. Um, and so it just happened that I was ready to start them all um, when the pandemic started. And I work at UC Santa Cruz and I came back from a work trip in early March and I was told like, grab your stuff and go home and we'll see you in a few weeks. And I was like, and then it was like, or a few months, or we don't know when. Um, so I really got to spend a lot of the the early, at least the beginning of of um, the pandemic, early twenty twenty, you know, into the fall of twenty twenty, um, working on illustrations about the redwood forest, which was such a great opportunity to kind of honor the things that I really love, you know, this place that I've spent so much time and, you know, the, the redwood forest is my most like familiar forest. That's what forest is in my mind, right? When I've been other places, I'm like, it just seems unusual to me to have like no laurel trees, for example, or no redwood trees. I'm like, oh, right. That's a, that's a thing, but it's not my most familiar. Um, so yeah, this is, you know, of course, like being on campus, you know, um, banana slugs are are the mascot and, and of course, like a, a kind of um, essential part <laughs> of the experience of, of the Santa Cruz Mountains, at least for me. So um, yeah, you know, and the salamanders being their only known predators uh, and the the hermit thrushes are, are just like, I don't know, they're just like a, such a sweet part and it's so sweet to hear them singing. Um, in the forest and how far their 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 voice carries um, in the understory, which is really cool. And and there's a big um, azalea pretty close to my office, and so I felt like, oh yeah, I have to include azaleas. <laughs> and then this year, I feel like the the fetid adder's tongue really like had a a bumper crop or something, or maybe people were just out and you know it's not something you know most folks can see because it comes on so early. So I had to include that as well, although that was not, that was of course before this year and well after they were done um, last year. Um, this piece also inspired by Redwood Forest. And this is, um, I lived on the edge of the forest um, for a little while and there was a California hazelnut tree right outside my window and there are Pacific wrens who would come and sing um, from the branches, which is just like, an incredible experience to like list just stand in my house and listen to them with their really complicated songs um and I also had the, the you know depending how you feel about it but I I feel a little bit fortunate that um I had um dusky footed wood rats that occasionally got into my house um thankfully they did not stay but um but yeah just they're such a cool and interesting creature and you know i know that they use um bay laurel as like a fumigant in their nests and so and again like the laurel to me is like that's the smell of the forest right that's the smell of forest to me is bay laurel um and tan oak, I mean, there's just such an interesting like history of tan oaks, um, you know, in terms of like industry and the development of Santa Cruz and, and all of that. And, and I think, I also think of like the forest edge, like where it's, especially when, on warm days with like the cicadas, you know, making their rasping calls. So um, yeah, so this, this is piece is kind of that edge of the forest as you kind of get into mixed, mixed redwood. And then this one is really about the kind of meadows, right? So giant chinkapin and um, uh, yerba santa and the golden hair streak butterfly uses giant chinkapin as its host plant. Um, and then the rest of these creatures are really kind of like meadow grassland um, species. So the meadow vole is kind of favorite prey of both. Um, white-tailed kites, which that's like their primary um, food source and, and their, their um, population, the kite population really relies on and fluctuates with the vole population, the meadow vole. Um, and then uh, the long-tailed weasels just love voles um, and their populations are really impacted by gray foxes. And last year there was a big outbreak of 
uh, canine distemper in the foxes at Pinnacles and lots and lots of foxes died. And I started seeing lots of weasels and I was like, wow, I've never seen so many weasels. Like what is going on? Like not a lot of weasels, you know, but I saw more than I'd ever seen. I thought, huh, that's kind of weird. And then I realized like, oh, the foxes died. So there's probably more weasels because they're not, you know, the pressure is not on them. And so, and now I'm curious, like, well, what does that mean for the vole population? And then what does that mean for the, for the kite population? So, you know, there's kind of always this like, like complex dynamics um, that I just love exploring. And this one was really fun to just kind of play with like all these different colors and, and, you know, all these different mammals and how they're connected to each other and, and, and where they fit in that kind of meadow you know, ecosystem. Um, so here's the tiger beetle. Um, and this is really coastal prairie, right? So um, let's see, the, we have California needle grass, which is our state grass, California poppies, our state flower. Um, and then, you know, other, other plants that live in the, you know, up in those coastal prairies. So I'm thinking about like, um, Marshall Fields or um, Marshall Meadows up there, um, kind of at the edge of of campus, and and all the creatures that the the flickers like to eat. So you know, um, earthworms and um, pill bugs and that kind of thing. But and I don't know that there's any documentation of of um, flickers eating uh, tiger beetles, but certainly they'll eat any insect they can get on the ground. So um, yeah, and just, you know, the, especially as the fire, the wildfires were kind of raging, I was really thinking a lot. This is like probably the last piece I did in this series. And I was really thinking a lot about um, prairie ecosystems and the kind of vulnerability of some of these species, right? The, you know, like the tiger beetle, um, you know, it's, it, it was very possible that we could lose the whole population or at least a, a significant portion of it. So I was really kind of thinking a lot about that as I was, I was, I was painting these. This is, this is a hard one um, you know, to, to kind of work on as, you know, knowing um, the impacts that were kind of unfolding as I was working on it. Um, and I think someone mentioned the, the, um, Sand hills. So this kind of incorporates multiple different types of habitats in the sand hills. Um, but I really wanted to feature some of the, you know, endemic and um, really specialized um, uh, insects, right? So the bandwing uh, grasshopper and the Mount Hermon June be beetle, and then the spine flower, um, silver leaf manzanita, and the wallflower. Um, and then the kestrels are there, you know, they're widespread, they're kind of all over the place, but, um, but they certainly eat um, insects. And so I just thought like, oh, it'll be really fun to, to include them. And I love being able to show like both male and female, um, uh, you know, forms, like they're, they're so strikingly different. Um, it's really cool to kind of see them together to, to kind of compare that and how easy, you know, for of, of all the raptor species, they're <laughs> the easiest to tell apart. Um, so yeah, this one was really fun also to kind of think about Zayani sandhills. And my family, you know, my great grandparents had a ranch um, in Scotts Valley and my mom and um, her siblings, you know, they would just go up into those sandhills and, you know, dig up shark's teeth and all that fossils and all that kind of stuff um, when they were kids. And then I think I showed you a little bit of this one earlier. So, you know, San Lorenzo River watershed that starts up in the mountains and, you know, really is kind of where the black salamanders kind of like to hang out in this wet, rocky places. And then, you know, as you kind of get down into the river ecosystem with the um, big leaf maple and, and you know, um, American dippers, I don't know that any are, have been documented nesting on the San Lorenzo or any of the creeks um, recently, but um, certainly they have been known to nest up there. Um, and then coho, of course, um, and, you know, kind of thinking about the, the needs of, of, you know, salmon and, and all kinds of other creatures for fresh water and, and clean, clean water. Um, and, you know, and kind of thinking about their needs for, um, yeah, protection in terms of like, yeah, that kind of habitat level or, you know, the system level. And I think that's the last one. Yeah, I guess so. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I guess, yeah, I'll just open it up to questions. If you have questions or things you want me to go back to and we could talk about um, or yeah, whatever.
Okay, you you missed that moth or butterfly there. Who is that one? On this one? Yeah. This is the um, eyed sphinx, eyed sphinx yeah. moth, and it uses willow. So that's a royal willow in this drawing. Um, and they use willow as their host plant. So they lay their eggs and their um, caterpillars eat willow. And we actually had one. We had one of these sphinx moths at our house, I think in the fall um, last year, which is, you know, is often how things end up in these illustrations is I'm like, oh, this moth showed up at my house. Or like, oh, <laughs> I met the person who, you know, is doing research on these, whatever, this project or this creature. So yeah, I had Sphinx Moth. Question on uh, Condor. Yeah. Condor. Yeah, so I know this is a little off topic from uh, Henry Cowell, but I, since you mentioned uh, that you did work with Condors, I don't, don't know if you uh, got to see the uh, new, newborn chick in Pinnacles or um, were involved at all with that project. I understand that they um, died off down to only 22 individuals back in the 1970s. And as you mentioned, the, um, the need to restore habitat, you, you know, the habitat and the relationships within an ecosystem when you get near extinction and, and you're trying to recover. But mm -hmm. there's also this genetic bottleneck problem Mm -hmm. where, where as, as I guess condor, I don't know how many condors there are that have come back in the, are they over a thousand or something now in pinnacles or? No, there's about a hundred birds in the central California flock. So that includes Big Sur and pinnacles is all kind of like a single flock because, you know, the birds do what they want. Um, the total in the wild is somewhere around 200. And then there's another 200 or so. And of course the numbers are fluctuating because right, we have baby condors. Um, uh, but then there's another 200 or so in um, captivity. So most of those are in captive breeding projects, programs um, at various like zoos and other facilities. Um, and then some are just, you know, there may be um, have some kind of injury or illness or they're being treated for lead poisoning or whatever um, and so they're in a facility somewhere for that reason um, but yeah so it's about half and half in terms of the total number um, half are in the wild and half are in captivity um, so yeah and it seems that so far the the genetic bottleneck has not manifested in any kind of problematic way yet um, it's hard to know how long something like that might take to show up. Um, the captive, you know, of course the captive breeding programs are, they're very careful. Like everybody knows, you know, there's a very extensive um, documenting of who's related to whom and, you know, and how birds can be paired and all of that. Um, in the wild, of course, like birds are going to do what they're going to do. And so I think, you know, when birds are released um, into a certain place, there's consideration for, you know, who might pair up with who. And so let's think about how we want to mix up the genetics as much as possible. So yeah, all of that is certainly part of the, the process for um, release sites. And I, I assume the same will be true when they're released up at Redwood. Yeah, just one quick follow up is um, <clears throat> on... Um... I don't know if the behavior, this would apply pretty much to any um, endangered species or, or, or the, the, of where their population has plummeted. But um, I understand from, from research on cheetahs that, that they have actually come back partly because of their behavior of being isolated. They like to be isolated from each other. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of slows down any virus that might go all the way through all the population. Right. I don't know about condors. Do they tend to be more like stay by themselves? No, they're really social. They're very yeah. social. And so um, that's part of why the lead poisoning issue is so hard because one bird will find a carcass or whatever, you know, and the, then the whole, you know, the whole crew shows up. And so if there's even a little bit of lead 
um, you know, the fragments of, of ammunition or whatever in the, in the carcass, um, then the possibility that, you know, a dozen birds could be lead poisoned by a single carcass is, you know, that's a high, a high possibility. And the same with DDT, right? So DDT is persisting in the marine environment. There's tons and tons of DDT, you know, uh, in the bottom of the ocean <laughs> and in, you know, down in Southern California. And, uh, and so it persists in the ocean, it comes up into the food chain, you know, up through the food chain, it's, it's concentrated in the fat of marine mammals, which of course have, you know, like tons and tons of fat. And so, I mean, I was at, I was out in Big Sur, maybe like 10 years ago, and I saw probably 16 condors, which is like, that's a lot to see all at once, considering how many there are in the world. And uh, they had clearly been feeding on a, a marine mammal that had washed up. So you think about 16 or 20 birds, all ingesting huge amounts of marine mammal fat um, that is potentially laden with DDT. Um, and so now you're talking about, you know, 20 birds that ha have a, a high level of DDT in their system. So yeah, it's, it's really that, you know, so their behavior can, right, for cheetahs, it might work really awesome. And for condors, not so awesome. So yeah, that, that can be a real challenge. And that's one of the big challenges with the recovery of the species. And that's true, I think, for every, you know, species recovery program is like, well, how, you know, how do you deal with the behavioral things that you can't necessarily predict until, you know, they're out there in the world. Right. And like, and then, you know, and then what do you do? Um, like, you know, otters jumping on kayaks. Like, what do you, I don't know that anyone predicted that. Right. <laughs> it's like, well, now what do we do? Um, you know, and how do you discourage them from doing that? It's not necessarily problematic for the animals, except that it's not good for them to be so close to humans. And, you know, but in terms of like, you know, are they going to be getting a disease or something? Like, I don't know. So yeah, that's, that's a big part of recovery programs is trying to figure out the behavioral stuff and what things work to your advantage and what things don't. Hey, Megan. Hey, Dylan. Can you talk a little bit about the symmetry of your artwork and like if there's like some conceptualism behind all the symmetry and? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think for, for me, immediate, my immediate kind of um, thought is, you know, when I'm, because this is, comes up all the time, and I think for me, part of it is that um, I think we really respond as humans to circular and symmetrical things, right? That's, I don't know what that is. I don't know where that comes from. I'm sure there's a good biological reason for that. Um, but I just think about like how often that is a, um, it's a, you know, it's a structure we use. It's a, it's a, yeah, shape that we're kind of drawn to, but also I think part of it too, is that I was thinking about, and, you know, when I was first working on these, I was thinking about food, food chains. And then I was like, well, wait, it's not really a chain. It's more like a web. And, you know, and then it's kind of, well, that's what, you know, then it kind of developed into this more circular um, format because that describes more, I think, accurately, the relationships right that it's not linear it's you know it's the there's this whole picture and that you can't really take one thing out without affecting the whole system right there's that famous john muir <laughs> quote but i think that's a that's a he's articulated something that i think most um, cultures, most folks understand inherently that things are, you know, when we are connected to the world, we understand that things are connected to each other and that we can't separate them. And so I think the circular format really kind of helps reiterate that and, and focus your attention on that, that it's, it's complicated, right? These relationships are complex. They're not always one way, right? It's not always a, I eat you and that's it for you, <laughs> you know, but that there's, yeah, there's multiple kind of avenues of connection. So yeah, does that it, answer it, your question? Yeah, it, it, it certainly does. And it's, it's so cool to hear you say that because as I look at your piece and my eye follows 
like the willow up and to the right, it it doesn't it doesn't leave the artwork. Like my eye is immediately brought back down. And so like I'm I'm like constantly searching into the image and I never break and like leave the canvas. Mm -hmm. And that's so so it's it's so so cool to hear you say that. Yeah. 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 And I think it's just yeah, I think it's it's also a nice container. You know, it's like a nice yeah, it's a nice container. And, you know, they're all a little bit different. I'll just kind of go back through. I mean, this one has a very similar kind of like parentheses, you know, um, and this one too. But then this one is a little bit, it's a little bit different of a shape. And I think it, the condor one is the same way, right? There's this kind of different shape. And so sometimes the creatures inform that a little bit. Um, but I think it helps to kind of, yeah, keep keep your kind of attention moving around, but also, yeah, stay focused on like, well, yeah, why is this thing here? And what's the relationship there? And um, yeah. How, how, do you, how do you determine where each character goes within the piece? Like, is, it, is that strictly physiological or how, like, yeah, how, how do you make that decision? That's a great question. So some of the early ones I was working on before, like these, these, I feel like are like, this is kind of like, yeah, okay, I've got, I've got my, like, I've got it figured out now. Um, I realized that like, like I did another one that had some rodents and owls. Right. And I, and it, on the, in the first version, I had the owls on the outside and there were more owls than there were rodents. And I was like, nope, <laughs> that's not how the world works, right? Like the predators are, there's fewer of them <laughs> almost always. Um, so sometimes, so like this one is a good example, right? The foxes are the apex predator here, but sort of so also are the, the kites. Um, but yeah, just kind of thinking about like, well, the, you know, the fox population is smaller than the weasel population is smaller than the vole population is smaller than the plant population, for sure. Um, the kites kind of, it, it messes with it a little bit because the voles and the kites are really tied super closely together. Um, so part of it is that part of it's about like where the creature falls in the in the kind of food web um but also but then there's like um i'm like oh yeah so tiger beetles it was like this piece is about tiger beetles so the tiger beetles have to be in the middle <laughs> right because like they are the star um and it's the same thing with the um with the banana slugs right i felt like well if i'm gonna do a piece about redwoods and i'm not gonna draw a redwood tree in the middle which I could, I've done that in other ones, but um, but in this case, I was like, well, yeah, the, the slugs have to go in the middle then. Um, so it sometimes depends on who's the star. Um, condors, right? Condors are the star there in the middle. Um, but it's also sometimes about yeah, where the creature falls in the in the in the system or in the story. Um, and like the otters, um, let's see, that one's a little ways back, but. Um, the otters are um they're sort of in the middle but they kind of so in this one this is really about like their role right in the kelp forest so they put pressure on um abalone and on urchins which we know of course right now is like a, such a huge story because of their the urchin impact on the kelp um, so the otters really put pressure on those two creatures, which then allows for the kelp forest, you know, it keeps the kelp healthy, and it also then allows for all these other creatures that live in the kelp forest to kind of like, you know, do their thing and also kind of have their, the habitat that they need. So sometimes it's also about kind of, yeah, again, this is, I think, about their positionality in the, in the system, and really kind of demonstrating what their role is. And I have a, a kind of, um, I don't know, sister to this one, which is about the otter role in the um, Elkhorn Slough. And it's kind of a similar story, right? They're putting pressure on crabs um, and the cra and that has allowed the, the eelgrass um, to come back, which is like, you know, what? No one had any, I think had any idea that when otters returned to the central coast that they would be, they would contribute to the recovery of eelgrass beds, which has have been just really impacted and you know really kind of decimated across the state. 
Um, and, but yeah, you know, UCSC researcher figured it out. <laughs> so um, yeah, so it really does depend kind of on what the story is, but I, I try to be mindful about like, well, who's the star and also what story am I trying to tell? Um, and sometimes like, you know, what are people interested in, right? Like otters, like, oh my gosh, of course. Um, but also, you know, condors and, you know, all kinds of things. It's amazing to me the things that people pick up on in, in different pieces. And, you know, like the salmon, right? Like salmon are a huge story, um, but they're also part of a bigger picture. So trying to balance that also is part of, is part of my decision-making. I want to mention now that Megan doesn't only do uh, Circle of Life. I, I, no, she, let's see. This is, <laughs> this is her, her, uh, her butterfly series. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so these, it's, it's the insect and a plant that they're related to. And these are really pretty too. So I really like these. <laughs> Thank you, Joyce. Yes. Oh, well <laughs> those are those are also relationships right like those are butterflies and moths with their host plant so that's an anaphyla moth with and it uses the caterpillars use miner's lettuce um yeah and so so that it's just it's a simplified version there's not a lot of complexity to those but right yeah so that's a clark's day sphinx and uh primrose evening evening primrose um so yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm definitely interested in like relationships between things, but certainly, yeah, I mean, I have all kinds of other work. Um, this is like the thing, you know, these ecosystem illustrations are really like the thing I'm into this is like my jam right now. Um, and I just, I have a huge like list, you know, people are always like, well, what about, you know, <laughs> my favorite creature or my project or my, you know, this other thing. And I'm like, yeah, I know I'm at, I'll just add it to the list. <laughs> Um, so I have a huge list uh, that just, it, it doesn't seem to get shorter, no matter how many of these I do, because um, there's just so many stories to tell. I mean, California is just so incredible. It's so complex. There's so many things going on. Um, and I, it's all I can do to kind of keep up with my own, like, oh yeah. And then when I go to the Eastern Sierra, then there's this whole other set of stories to tell about the Eastern Sierra. And there's a whole other set of stories to tell about the North Coast and, you know, the desert and, you know, on and on and on. Um, so it's about all I can do to keep up with my own like adventures um, and telling those stories that, you know, that I find compelling, but also that I think folks want to learn more about or maybe need to learn more about. Um, so, you know, and I'm, I try to be mindful about controversy. Um, <laughs> you know, like I really want to do something about Thule elk um, up at Point Reyes and I know that's really controversial, but, um, but I also, I want to know more and I want to uh, understand kind of what the, what the issues are and, and think about how might we, um, yeah, just, do our best to, to find a balance um, that that works for as many creatures as possible without centering humans as much as we normally do. So I think we get we get our the more than our fair share of um, attention and and our needs get kind of put first at, to the, at the disservice of of others that deserve to be here as much as we do. So I'm trying to help kind of pull us back towards that understanding a little bit, if I can. Hey, Megan, somebody in the chat box asked uh, if there are other platforms upon which they can find your artwork, if they oh, wanted sure. to just like see your portfolio or like, you know, buy a piece or something <laughs> like that. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I have just kind of moved, you know, I've the web is a vast um, landscape. <laughs> and so um, I do have a website that is under my personal name. So, um, and I guess, oh, I don't know. Well, I can drop it in the chat when I, when I stop screen sharing, I think. Um, and then um, 
so it's under my personal name, just my name, meganneco.com. Um, and if you click, so my that's a good example of my portfolio and it's basically just my portfolio online. Um, and if you click on shop, you will go to Seven Ravens Studio. That's my studio name. That's like my public business uh, enterprise. And um, there you can buy all the things. So I have cards, um, greeting cards, like what, um, what Joyce shared. I have um, prints of all of these. Uh, I've got tote bags and tea towels and <laughs> Um, all kinds of things because you know capitalism um, and stickers and, <laughs> and all kinds of stuff um, so yeah you can definitely buy them and the originals are all for sale except this one actually this um, otters piece is owned by the city of Santa Cruz it hangs in city hall um, I have not yet actually gotten to see it in place because you know COVID times um, but yeah everything else I'm pretty sure is available so yeah all of that's available on my website um so i'll drop that i'll make sure i drop it in the chat or dylan i can send it to you and you can share it with folks awesome yeah any other questions anything else there's another question in the chat box asking if um it if you concern yourself with making sure that your intended story is specifically told in your pieces, or if you kind of let the audience run away with whatever story they might interpret? Oh gosh, that is a great question. Um, I try, I really try to make the, the provide enough information in the piece that I hope folks kind of go, huh? Well, I wonder if that means that the otters eat those and they go clams. And I'm like, oh gosh, okay, abalone, but whatever, it's fine, it doesn't matter. Um, and then they're like, well, what about the, what are these fish? What are these red and black striped fish? So I hope that it sparks people's curiosity to learn. I don't expect that they will necessarily get it. Um, I don't expect that people know that giant salamanders are the only known predators of banana slugs, um, <laughs> you know, but they might be like, hey, that looks like a redwood. And there's banana slugs, which I, I think I probably know, like they live in the redwoods, but like, what are all these other things? Do they only live here? You know, so I, 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 I hope that it sparks people's curiosity and gets them asking questions that then they can find out for themselves. Um, I also know that people are going to tell whatever story <laughs> they want to about the things. Um, and that's okay. That's okay with me. Um, I mean, I think it's, you know, of course, like there's a part of me as a scientific illustrator that's like, it's not a clam, it's an abalone. But like, you know, like, whatever. <laughs> I can't control everything. Um, so, so I do try and I, I try to make sure that the, the creatures are, you know, these are, these are pretty big paintings like in, in real life. Um, so it's hard to tell on the screen, of course, but like the otter pieces, um, I'm using full size sheets of watercolor paper. So they're like 22 by 32 is a full size sheet. Um, so these are, you know, 20 inches. Yeah. 20 inches by 20 inches or more generally. So the, the drawings are not super detailed, um, but I hope that they at least are like, you know, I try to make them accurate to the creature. And so that like, people are gonna be like, oh yeah, that's the right amount of segments on the legs of a crab, or that's the right, the fin arrangement on the rockfish is correct because if it's not, someone's gonna tell me about it. Um, and that's cool, <laughs> but I try to do my homework. Um, so, you know, I, I recognize that like, maybe it doesn't come across though. Maybe people aren't gonna be like, oh, that's a, you know, whatever, um, a kelp crab or whatever. Um, so I do what I can to make it clear and knowing that people will tell whatever story they want <laughs> about it. Um, but if it, it gets them asking questions, then that is, I feel like I've done my job. Um, and I want it to be beautiful. I want it to be something people respond to. And, and so that's also part of it as well. You know, so I'm trying to balance that out too um, when I'm working on these. Megan, this was absolutely incredible. <laughs> it was super <laughs> motivational, super, super cool. 
thank you so, so, so much for being here tonight. Sure. Um, and for those who have, who didn't see the link was in the chat box now. So, awesome. um, yeah, check out, check out seven Ravens studio. Yeah. And I'll just throw a couple more things in there. Oh yeah. Good. Very good. Cool. Oh, and oh, I should say, oh my gosh, I would be remiss if I did not say that you can also see two of the illustrations I showed you tonight. So the foxes and the banana slugs are at the Museum of Natural History in Santa Cruz right now as part of the Art of Nature exhibit. Um, it's a smaller show than usual because COVID times, but um, it is up through June and it is beautiful. And there's this incredible array of really talented artists. I'm so, every year that show just continues to blow me away. So um, you can go to the museum in person now, if you are comfortable, there are appointments. So you can be in there like you know, by yourself or with just one or two other people. Um, but also there's a virtual exhibit. And so um, I'll throw that chat in there too. And um, throw the information in the chat also. Um, so yeah, you can totally go see at least two of those um, illustrations in person right now, um, which is really exciting. And so, and I think that's the only place in my work is right now. And then in October, I'll be participating in Monterey County Open Studios, um, which I've been affiliated with through my Elkhorn Slough um, artist in residence. They've continued to be like, yeah, you can come. Just, it's fine. You don't live in Monterey. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So if you want to see the more things in person, that'll be another opportunity. Final question. Um, do you have any projects in the making that revolve around creosote bush? <laughs> The oh, desert. Man. Oh, man. Um, I don't currently. <laughs> and I will say um, that I'm focusing on kind of like this part of California, the central part of California right now. Um, but my long term, I mean, you know, if I live a long life, I will try to illustrate as many of the representative species of California habitats as I can. Um, I've thought about like, if I could do it full time every day for the rest of my life, I don't think I could cover the whole state, but man, creosote is so cool. Um, and so, yeah, I'll just, I'll add it on the list. And when I get to the desert, when I get to the desert section, um, it'll be in there, but I, I can't promise it'll be anytime soon. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here tonight, Megan. Uh, Thank we, you. we all really, really appreciate your time and sharing your knowledge with us. This has been great. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks again for having me. And I'll throw a few things in the chat, but, and I'll hang around if people have extra questions or whatever. So yeah.